battery pack died, Darren. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. A little bit more chilly out today than it was yesterday. Let's stand together as we join in worship and prepare our hearts. We'll sing this familiar hymn, I am resolved no longer to linger charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. Let's sing this together. I am resolved no longer to linger charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He saith, do what He willeth, He is the living way. And I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still I will enter in. And I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest. I will come to thee. And fifth is the last. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. And I will hasten to him. And so glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee, and I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. Father, this morning, we are resolved to follow you. God, I ask that this would be the prayer of our hearts, that we would be faithful and true to your word, to your teaching. And God, as we fellowship now and as we uh, lift your name and as we study your word, we ask that you would bless this time, that you would bless these people. And God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you because of your love for us. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you take some time to say good morning to the people around you, and then we'll... Let's continue in our time of worship. This morning we'll be beginning a new series, going through the book of Genesis, specifically the life of Abraham. And uh, one of the things that we're going to see this morning is that Abraham worshipped God because of his incredible promises. So uh, we recognize that 
several thousand years removed from Abraham, we have received some incredible promises from the Lord ourselves, so we have many reasons to worship this morning. So let's sing, O four, a thousand tongues to sing, followed by Be Thou My Vision as a prayer of our hearts. So let's sing together. O oh, four, a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. He breaks, he breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. Let every tongue, tribe, and nation proclaim anthems of praise to His glorious name. Let every tongue, tribe, and nation proclaim anthems of praise to His Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Let every tongue, tribe, and nation proclaim anthems of praise to His glorious name. Let every tongue, tribe, and nation proclaim anthems of praise. To his glorious name, let every tongue, tribe, and nation proclaim anthems of praise to his glorious name. and tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise the glories of my God and King the triumphs of His grace and as we recognize the greatness of our God let's ask Him now to be our vision my spot. <laughs> oh, we're up one or two, aren't we? There we go. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word, I am 
Father, we do ask that you would be our vision this morning, that we would see the world through your eyes, that we would see our need to grow in our knowledge and in our love for you, but God, to grow in our, in our love for the world and our desire to share the gospel with them. So we just ask that you would bless the rest of our time in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So this is normally where I'd hand things off to Blair. Blair's sick. So, or playing hooky, one of the two. I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. So I just have a handful of announcements. And by handful, I mean we have a lot of announcements this morning. Um, but I just want to go ahead and start with this card that we received. It says, Dear Church Family, uh, thank you so much for the many calls and especially prayers during my recent illness and hospital visit. Your care and concern means so much. Lovingly in Christ, Margaret McCall. I had a great chat with her this morning. Glad she's doing better. Uh, let's just continue to pray for the McCall family. So we have a bunch of stuff going on over the next couple of weeks. You guys can see uh, the center section here of uh, your bulletin that just kind of points out what we have going on. I want to give everybody a chance to look at the back of the bulletin, however, because I have a very important announcement this morning that I can't share too many details about. So, I'm going to be as vague as possible while being as specific as possible, okay? We have a missionary family connected to the church that is in need of some supplies and some belongings from home to be sent to where they are. For safety reasons, I can't say who it is or where they are. If you want those details, please come and talk to me after the service. I'm more than happy to tell you, um, but our services are recorded and posted online, so for safety, we're not giving out any details about this missionary family. Um, the easiest way for us to send these supplies, which already have been gathered, um, is we are going to purchase two suitcases. Um, to send things over, it is much cheaper to send a suitcase with a family member than to actually try to mail any belongings. So we want to help this family by buying a couple of suitcases. Uh, one, to send their belongings to them, and two, so that they can have some new suitcases uh, for when they need to travel on furlough in, in the months and years to come. Um, one of these suitcases has already been purchased. We have need for one more, and I am extending that to you this morning to take responsibility as a church family, um, and I am trusting God that by the end of our time together, when we all go home, that second suitcase will be purchased. It's $120. Uh, if you would like to meet this need, please come see me. Um, this is an awesome opportunity. I wish I could share more detail from the pulpit, um, but this is a huge opportunity for us to do something very small 
um, to be a big encouragement to one of our missionaries who's working very hard to get the gospel out um, in the world. So if you want to help, please see me following the service, um, and we would love to be able to do that by the end of the day. That's the big one that I wanted to get out there, get everybody's attention. Um, I'll, while we're at the back of the bulletin, I'll point out this is week two of our Bible reading plan. Everybody, I hope, survived the first week, um, and we encourage you to keep, uh, keep up with that. As far as upcoming dates, I want to remind uh, our Club 55 group um, that if you're planning to attend on Thursday, we have a sign-up sheet at the back to check your food preference. Um, and if you have your childhood uh, picture, I guess that's something you guys are supposed to have, a picture from your childhood. There's a brown envelope next to that sign-up sheet uh, for you guys to drop that off in this morning. Uh, we have something new starting up. Uh, Darren, is this starting tonight? All right. Sundays here in the Flex Center, Sunday nights in January and February, we are going to be starting back up our walking club and some fun recreational activities. So if you guys are looking for something to do this evening uh, from 6.30 to 9, that seems like a really big chunk, um, but from 6.30 to 7, we have the walking club. So if you guys want to come, get some laps in, you're more than welcome. And then from 7.15 to 9, we'll have some uh, recreational activities that'll look different, I'm sure, every week, but we definitely invite people to come out and enjoy uh, just enjoy the facility and uh, spending some time together. All right, Sunday evening. Also tonight, just before the walking club, we have a youth ministries committee meeting. Okay, so there's a lot going on tonight. I didn't realize this. I was going to take a nap this afternoon. I guess I'm not. All right. <laughs> uh, but keep in mind all the things that are going on this week. Uh, WMS, you guys are meeting tomorrow at 2. Um, uh, there is a Cove Academy Council meeting at 7. Tuesday, Parents and Tots Group. Tuesday evening, we have a deacons meeting. Wednesday, um, midweek Bible study with Jeff is going to not be resuming this week. Okay. I'm going to say now, because Jeff's not here, that it's not on this week. It'll start at a later date. It just says mid-January. I haven't gotten any details yet. Um, so enjoy the week off. Uh, Thursday, Club 55, Kids Quest shift on Friday. Uh, let's see here. Upcoming dates, January 16th at 7 p.m. The Finance Committee has a meeting. And then February 11th and 12th, uh, we're going to be having a fun ministry weekend. More details to come, but uh, Ed Seeley is going to be here uh, to do some music and some speaking, and we're looking forward to that time. That's February 11th and 12th. Uh, we'll have more info for you next week. And then it wouldn't be nepotism if I didn't make sure that I give special attention to this announcement. Uh, my sister-in-law, Kyla, is having a baby shower on the 21st at 11 a.m. Um, so uh, load up. Cash is king. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so make sure uh, if you want to come and be a part of that, that's on January 21st at 11 a.m. And now I'm going to get some dirty looks at supper tonight, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> I believe that's all that I have by way of immediate announcements. I do just want to remind folks as well on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We do have coffee here in the cafe. You are all more than welcome to attend. Um, it's the beginning of the year, so folks are kind of trickling in at this point, but uh, feel free to come 10 a.m., get some coffee. Uh, that'll Hopefully that coffee will keep you awake long enough for my sermon, and then uh, we'll have a great day because of it. Sounds good? Let's go ahead and continue in our time of worship before we look into the word uh, one of my favorite hymns what a friend we have in jesus let's sing this together as we worship i'll invite you to stand friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, covered 
with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for sake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. We'll find a solace there. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to the Lord in prayer Can we find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrow share Jesus Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Isn't it wonderful that we can take our sorrows, our burdens, our troubles to the Lord? I think so often we come to church on a Sunday morning, and certainly to some extent there's 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 an aspect of joy. We, we do call this our, our, our Sunday morning worship celebration. This is a time of, of reflecting on what Christ has done, but uh, at the same time, we're all coming off of a pretty long week, aren't we? We're, we're, we're here. Some of us have had a difficult week. Some of us have had a good week, but we recognize that here uh, we're with family, and we can worship God, and we can rely on his faithfulness to be a comfort to us, even, even in the midst of difficulty. So let's sing this together faithful forever you are faithful Faithful and true 
is the name of the Lord. You are faithful, God. And I will sing to the maker of heaven and earth. God, you reign forever and your love will endure. Faithful and true is the name of the Lord. You are faithful, God. You are faithful, God. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, even in spite of our shortcomings in spite of our lack of faith at times, and we just ask now that we will be reminded of your love for us. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time, we'll go ahead and dismiss the little ones on downstairs. Well, for those of you who didn't just hear, the, uh, the need for the suitcases has officially been met, so let's just take a moment to thank God and, uh, and praise him for his goodness. Father, you are the God who lives and sees and knows all, who knows all details, who knows uh, what things need to be sorted out, and God, we have uh, faithfully followed you, and, and now, God, we get to see uh, you working, and we just thank you so much uh, for the willingness of, of, of people to, to give. God, but most importantly for the fact that you provide for our needs and for, and for uh, this, the sake of your gospel. God, we just thank you for this, and we ask that your name will be praised through this endeavor, that your name will be glorified and lifted high, God, and that we would receive no, no, no credit, no glory for any of this, but that all honor and praise would go to you. Father, we love you because you loved us first, and we're so thankful to be able to do this. In Christ's name, amen. That's exciting when that kind of stuff happens. I don't know about you. I like seeing God work, and it's very fun. There we go. Goodness. Be I feel like I need one of those, like, applause signs that says amen. You know what I mean? <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'll start with a story. I wasn't going <laughs> to. So, so I had uh, a dear friend of mine uh, that I used to work with at Living Waters, for those of you who know. I used to work at a, a conference center in, in northern Maine. Uh, a friend of mine, Emily, her father was a guy named Eddie Piper. Some of you might know that name because I actually found out not too long ago that he was here like ages ago. And Eddie Piper was a friend of mine, and he was the self-proclaimed best gospel singer in the world. He had a very low opinion of himself. Um, but no, Eddie was a really, really fun guy, and he, uh, whenever he would go to churches and when he would sing, he actually had a little amen sign on a stick. So halfway through a song, he would sing something, he'd hold it up, and everybody would have to shout amen together, and it was... Really, really fun. No, I miss Eddie. He was, he, was, he was great. Well, this morning, we are going to be starting a new series. Um, I'm actually very excited about this, probably more excited than I've been in a while. Ask Vashti. I was, I was rate giddy last night. I say ask Vashti, and then I point at Kyla because I just assume my wife's there. Sorry, <laughs> Kyla. Man, I'm just raking you across the coals this morning. <laughs> No, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Genesis because we're going to be starting a series on the life of Abraham. And we're going to be calling this series Following in Faith. Following in Faith. And over the next several weeks, we are going to follow along verse by verse uh, through Abraham's life as we see him answer the call of God on his life and follow in simple faith. We're going to see the high points. 
we're going to see some low points. We're going to see some moments where Abraham does some incredible things for the sake of God, and then we're going to read some things, fair warning, it's a good thing the children are downstairs, that are downright morally reprehensible. And we're going to read some things over the next couple of weeks that are going to make us say, how on earth is this man considered to be, as, as Paul calls him, the father of those who believe or the father of faith? We're going to see some things that take place that are going to make us scratch our heads. But in all of this, my hope and my prayer for us is that through it all, we're going to see that Abraham, although incredibly inconsistent, faithfully followed a very consistent God, an unchanging God, a God whose grace is unwavering and whose expectation for humanity has always been simple faith and obedience and faithfulness and we're going to see the faithfulness of God to fulfill his word. So, in order to get to Genesis chapter 12, I'm about to attempt to cover Genesis 1 through 11 by way of introduction. And on that, I think we should probably pause for prayer. Okay. <laughs> Father, this morning as we look into your word, I would ask that you would uh, open our hearts to be receptive to what we read God, we ask that your spirit would, would guide us as we read through uh, these very familiar verses. God, many of us know the story of Abraham by heart. We've, we, we learned it growing up as children. We've, we've heard thousands of sermons probably on this. Uh, but God, I just ask that as we seek to, to see Abraham's faithfulness, that you would encourage our hearts to desire to grow in faith, to grow in obedience, and submission to your word and to your calling on our lives. And God, we just ask that you would speak now, that my words would be few, and that you would teach us this morning. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, let's recap. The story up until this point, Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, to give us just a little bit of context, I want to explain uh, the fact that the, the book of Genesis was written by Moses, shortly after the exodus from Egypt, okay? We understand that Moses was led by the Holy Spirit to write the first five books of the Bible that we call the Pentateuch, the Old Testament Torah, as, as the Hebrews call it. And he wrote the, this book of Genesis as instructed by the Holy Spirit following the exodus of Egypt in order to provide the children of Israel with three things. Keep in mind, when Israel left Egypt, they had been there for over 500 years, They'd been enslaved. They've been uh, submitted to seeing all sorts of pagan worship and the worship of false gods in Egypt. So as they have now been delivered by this God of their forefathers, the one called the Great I Am, Moses is led by the Holy Spirit to write a book to help them know their history. And the, and the book of Genesis serves to do three things. One, it provides Israel with a written history of God's creation. Two, it provides Israel with the origins of the nation of Israel. And that's where we come to in chapter 12, is the beginnings of the nation of Israel. But most importantly, the main, re the main purpose of Genesis is to establish God's promise of a Messiah. And we're going to see that as we, we, we power through these first 11 chapters, that the book of Genesis does these three things. It gives Israel a history of the world, it gives them a history of their nation, and most importantly, it establishes the promise from the very beginning that God would send a Messiah. So, we're going to sum up the first 11 chapters. Everybody buckle up. Here we go. Chapters 1 and 2, God creates the universe and man. Everything from nothing, six-day creation, seventh-day rest, everything was perfect. God creates Adam and Eve in his image and tells them to be fruitful and multiply, to tend the garden, to worship him, and he gives them one rule. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to choose for yourself to have the authority that only God should have. So then we come to Genesis chapter 3, where man, as deceived by Satan in the form of a serpent, rebels against God, eats of the tree, and in that moment recognizes the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, 
has been, um, has rebelled against God. And then the second half of Genesis chapter three, God promises a redeemer. And this is where I'm gonna pause for just a minute. This is, this is the, the centerpiece of the book of Genesis. Because it is here when man has fallen to his lowest that God comes in and promises a redeemer. In Genesis chapter three, Sorry, you read this. And the Lord God said to the serpent, this is after Adam and Eve have sinned, God has come and seen them in their wickedness, and they blame the serpent. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all of the days of your life. And then we come to Genesis three fifteen, which is what, what, theological scholars call the Protevangelium, the first mention of the gospel. In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In this moment, when Adam and Eve have fallen to their lowest state, they, they are fallen, they have rebelled against God. God comes in and he says, you guys have messed up. And now because of your sin, mankind, humanity, all of creation is cursed, but I am going to send someone, the offspring of a woman, who will bruise the head of the serpent, the one who deceived. But in that moment, the serpent will bruise his heel. Now, I think it's safe to say we all understand that a head injury is much more significant than a heel injury. We recognize it in the gospel while Christ was slain for our sins. Though his heel was bruised, he rose from the dead, defeating sin, defeating death, and crushing the head of the serpent. And we recognize that ultimately uh, when Christ returns for a second time, uh, the devil will be ultimately defeated forever. But this verse, Genesis 3.15, we call this the Pro-Evangelium, the first mention of the gospel because this verse presents the first two elements that form the basis of Christianity, that form the narrative of the gospel. And that's this, that mankind is cursed because of Adam's sin, that creation is fallen and in need of redemption, but God has promised to send a savior. That's the gospel in a nutshell. We are wicked, we are fallen, we are cursed because of sin, but God has sent a redeemer. And that's why Genesis 3.15 is such a wonderful verse, and that's why it's really the theme verse for the book of Genesis, because in this moment of time, when mankind had fallen, God immediately stepped in and made a promise. And we're gonna see as we move forward that the entire story of Abraham is the first step of God fulfilling that promise made here in Genesis chapter three. That although mankind has fallen, he's gonna send someone. So that's Genesis one through three. Genesis four through eight, we really see this, this chronological setting of man becoming continually evil. We see the generations of Adam and his children. The very first story we read in Genesis 4 is what? The first two sons, the first two brothers, and one kills the other one, and it only goes downhill from there. In Genesis 4 through 8, we see man growing continually evil, growing in technology, growing in, 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 in wickedness, growing in their cities and in their population, all culminating to this point where because their wickedness had grown so much, we come to Genesis 9 where God says it, 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 it regrets my heart that I have created these people and they have become so wicked. So he, he cleans the slate, he floods the earth, but he saves a remnant. Noah and his family who faithfully followed God, he rescues them in the ark as well as the livestock in the animal kingdom and they come and they come out of the ark in Genesis 10. And then Genesis 10 through 11 is Noah's family populating the earth. God tells them to be fruitful and multiply, and, and the first thing Noah's descendants do is say, we don't like that. We don't like the filling the earth part, so we're going to come to one location, and we are going to come to this plain of Shinar, and we are going to build a city that is going to blow everybody's mind because of its technological advancements, and then we are going to build a tower so high 
that it is shaking our fist at God saying you can never flood us again because we will build a tower so high that no matter how much water you throw at us, we will be like God's, we will be above it all. And what does God do? He goes in and he says, no, I told you to do something, you're gonna do it. He confuses the language and from that we see Noah's family spreading out and populating the earth. Genesis 1 through 11, boom, five minutes. What? (laughs) Just saying, just saying, write it down, you know, make a note, Colin's awesome. I'm just kidding. So we come to Genesis 11, and this is where the turning point is. We see this genealogy of, of, of Noah's descendants, specifically the descendants of his son Shem, coming all the way to where we're going to begin our time of reading this morning in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. But I just want to, to point out this one, one more fact before we move forward. Genesis 1 through 11 basically tells the story of God's relationship with all of humanity. God created humanity. He loved humanity. Humanity rebelled. Because of their rebellion, God had to introduce punishment, but he's always seeking to save a remnant of humanity. And then we see God tell humanity to multiply the earth. When we come to chapter 12, From chapter 12 on, we're no longer reading about God's relationship with all of humanity. We're seeing his relationship with one specific family. One specific family that starts with a guy by the name of Terah. So if you want to follow along with me, we're going to talk a little bit about Abram's family beginning in Genesis chapter 11, verses 27 through 32. Now, These are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in in the land of his kindred, the Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from the Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And the days of Terah were 205 years. Then Terah died in Haran. So we're here to study the story of Abram, who will later become Abraham, But we have to start here in chapter 11 where we see the genealogy of Shem's descendant named Terah. We don't know a whole lot about Terah. We have a a few things that I'll mention later on, but what I want to do right now is as we've read these verses, there's a bunch of names in there. There's Terah, there's Abram, there's Nahor, there's Haran, there's uh, uh, Milcah, there's Iscah, there's Lot, there's... um, Sarah, there's a bunch of names here, but really I want us to focus on three individuals because these three individuals are going to be the the heavy hitters of the narrative following the next several chapters. The first individual is Terah's son, Abram. Abram's name means exalted father, which we're going to see is a little bit ironic seeing as he has no children, but his name for now is Abram. Later on, we're going to see God change his name to Abraham. And this is a pretty big theme in the, go- in, in the book of Genesis because over and over, God is constantly changing people's names. And as he changes their names, he's giving them a new identity that, that helps to promote his character and his plan and his will for their life. So we'll begin with Abram, whose name means exalted father. And then Abram has a wife, Sarai, whose name means princess. And here we see... In verse 30, we're told that Sarai is barren. She has no child. And this is going to be a pretty major plot point moving forward. So just kind of as we're setting things up, if you're making notes, note this. Abram's name means exalted father. He has married his princess. I got a one-up on Abraham because I married a queen. Vashti, Esther, chapter one. Oh, hello. Okay. (laughs) Love you. I didn't tell her I was going to do that. I've had this in my notes for, for a week. All right, so, so Abram and Sarai have no children, but then there's a third character introduced, and this is the character of Lot. Lot's story 
is, is pretty sad, not going to lie. It's got some pretty low points. And we're going to read them, and we're going to study them, and we're going to see that uh, some, some terrible, horrible things happen in the book of Genesis. And none of these things does God condone, but in his grace, he still, he still carries these people through these difficult situations. And Lot's story really begins with tragedy. Because as soon as we're introduced to Lot, in verse 27, it says, And Haran fathered Lot. Immediately we read, and Haran died before the pre- in, in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in the earth of the Chaldeans. So as soon as we're introduced to Lot, immediately we're told that his father dies. And this is where we see the relationship between Abram, whose name is Exalted Father, taking Lot under his wing uh, a, a, as a ward, as an adopted son, so to speak. And we're going to see that Abram wants to do what's best for Lot, but ultimately Lot's going to make his own decisions and it's going to be uh, a difficult and a sad story. But we don't need to dwell on that today. What we read here is that Abram and his family lived in the city of Ur. It says the Ur of the Chaldeans. This tells us that it's specifically, there was, there was a handful of cities in ancient Mesopotamia named Ur, but this one is specifically the Ur of the Chaldeans, which tells us that this was the city in southern Babylonia, which is in modern day Iraq, and uh, I'll have a map up a little bit later to kind of show you guys a little bit of what that is. Um, We don't know much about Terah and his family, but scripture does tell us one thing. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, of course my bookmark fell out, didn't it? Of course it did. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, we read this about Terah. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, and they served other gods. We don't know much about Terah, but Scripture tells us that he was not a worshiper of the one true God. He was a worshiper of the false gods of the Chaldeans. Um, What we know about the city of Ur is that it was uh, a, a, a stronghold in the Sumerian Empire in Mesopotamia, and it was um, the location of a massive ziggurat, and the ziggurat was, w- was a temple to these pagan gods. So we don't know much about Terah other than he did not worship the one true God, and he lived in a pagan city, and yet he decides one day that he's going to pack up his family, and they are going to move to the region of Canaan. They're going to move back to Canaan. Uh, some, some historians say that that was where Terah was originally from, so they had come to Ur because that's where commerce was, that's where uh, they could grow in wealth and industry, and then, and then something towards the end of his life said, you know what, I want to go back to my home. So they begin to make their way to Canaan, but they stop in a place called Haran. Now, it's spelt the same as Haran, but they're two separate things, so that's why I'm I'm, I'm pronouncing them a little bit differently. So they go to this place called Haran, and they settle there. It's almost as if I was wanting to travel and, say, go to Sackville, New Brunswick, and I make it as far as Oxford, Nova Scotia, and I say, I'm going to stop here. Doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Because Tara's wanting to move to Canaan, and yet they settle in Haran. We don't know whether it's for, for health reasons, but we do say, or we do see here in verse 32 that the narrative of chapter 11 ends with the death of Terah here in Haran. And then we come to chapter 12, and this is where uh, we read some of the most famous verses in Scripture. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country. And your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And to him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God calls Abram. Now, Genesis chapter 12 actually begins by backtracking a little bit, okay? When we read, now the Lord said to Abram, in the original Hebrew, what this actually says is, now the Lord had said to Abram. See, there, there's this kind of conception that, that 
Abram came all the way to Haran, and then all of a sudden God says, guess what, I'm going to take you somewhere else. But actually, and, and, and Stephen, the apostle Stephen, tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, that God had actually spoken to Abram while they were still back in Mesopotamia, before they even came to, Ur, or before they even came to Haran. God had said to Abram, and you may even see a footnote in your Bible there that when it says the Lord said, it actually says the Lord had said. So the Lord had already called Abram, and it almost seems as if Terah wanting to move the family to Haran was that little nudge that needed to get Abram out the door, to get him on the track of where he needed to be. But here in Genesis chapter 12, after Terah has passed, after the old guard has passed away, the worshiper of false gods has passed away, now Abraham is left alone and God calls him. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country. Now this right here, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, this is the turning point in the book of Genesis. Okay, this is, this is where the entire tonal voice of the book, this is where the entire narrative takes this shift. As we said, verses one, or chapters 3 through 11, uh, the, the, the Ne- the, the, blah, 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 blah. the narrative is predominantly negative. The narrative is predominantly negative. That's, that's a tongue twister. So the narrative is predominantly negative in, verse, in chapters 3 through 11 as it points to the deterioration of humanity because of the curse of sin. But here we see this tonal shift as God begins to enact his plan of redemption. When God says to Abraham, go from your country, this is the turning point. This is the beginning of of God fulfilling his promise from Genesis chapter 3, right? This is the moment where everything changes. God is not seeking to flood the earth again. He is not seeking to to wipe out humanity for, for their sinfulness. He's saying, this is where it all changes. This is where it begins. This is where I begin to make good on my promise from Genesis chapter 3. It's the beginning of him fulfilling his promise to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So in this moment, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. He says to Abraham, Get up and go. I'm not telling you where you're going. I will tell you when you get there, but you're going to go, and I'm going to show you this wonderful thing. And I want us to notice here that God's call on Abram's life commands him to abandon the traditional sources of security and identity. He says, leave your house, leave your family, and leave the land of your father's house. And some of those things that are, that are, are, are traditionally the sources of our sense of identity and security are what? Our family and our home. And God says to Abram, I want you to take your family and your home, and I want you to leave. I want you to gather your wife and Lot, and I want you to go so that you can't depend on human support. I want you to place your faith fully in me and follow and to trust God fully. So for Abram to obey, he needs to have faith in God, not relying on anybody else. He must trust God fully. And that's where we'll, we'll highlight a few things later on, but Abram truly is the father of, of those who have faith, as we're going to read, as Paul calls them later on. But he wasn't always that way. It took a first step of faithfully following God. And this command to leave comes with a threefold promise. The first parts of what we know is the Abrahamic covenant, and I don't want to go into too much detail on the Abrahamic covenant yet because we'll get to Genesis 15 and we'll see kind of the, the, the fullness of that covenant. But God here makes three promises. He says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in, and in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he makes three promises. First, he says, I will make you into a great nation. This is the promise of the nation of Israel. God is going to take this one guy, Abram, whose name is Exalted Father, who has no children, and he says, I'm going to make your descendants into a great nation. Finally, or secondly, he says, I'm going to bless you. He says, those who bless you, I will bless, and whoever curses you or dishonors you, I will curse. This is God's promise to protect and preserve the nation of Israel, 
okay? So God has promised the nation of Israel. Now he is promising to protect and preserve the nation of Israel in the memory of Abram. But finally, and this is the most important, God will bless the world through Abraham. He says, and in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. And this is where God is promising the seed of the woman, the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah to come through the line of Abram. So God calls Abraham. It's this turning point in the book. Abraham has to trust God fully, but God's not just leaving him hanging. He's saying, look, you follow me in faith, and I'm going to do all of these things. None of these things are contingent on Abraham. God is saying, I am going to do this. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and all of the world will be blessed through your family and your descendants. And and this final promise, the promise of a blessing through Abram's family, God will reaffirm these promises to Abram's son, Isaac, and to his grandson, Jacob, and to the nation of Israel. Am I missing a page? Oh, no, skipped a part. (laughs) So God calls Abraham, and what do we read? I love you guys. So we come to verse 4. God has promised this blessing as Abraham is called to go. So Abraham obeys. Verse 1, so Abram went, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all of their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah, and at the time the Canaanites were in the land. So Abraham goes, and this is where I I thought it might be helpful just to put up a little map. I said I wanted to use a map last week, and I didn't, so here you go. Uh, So Abram and Terah lived here, southern Babylonia in the city of Ur. They go all the way up to Haran, and that is where God says, okay, Abram, you've had time to mull this over. Now it's time to go. Terah's gone. It's time to go. So Abram and his family make their way south from Haran, coming into the land of Canaan to the place at Shechem. And when they reach Shechem, we come to verse 7, and it's, it's this wonderful thing. In, in, in the beginning of chapter 12, God says, go, and I'll show you where you're going. Go to this land that I will show you. So Abram and his family simply start to go. And as soon as they come to Shechem, we come to verse 7, and then the Lord appeared. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. When Abram reaches Shechem to the oak of Morah, God appears and God promises the fourth aspect of the Abrahamic pro- er, covenant, and that is the land, the land of Israel. So God has called Abraham to follow him in faith, and there's four provisions. First one, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. The entire world is going to be blessed through your descendants, and I'm going to give you this land as an inheritance. Now, uh, this is the land of Israel, obviously, where where we see the country today. Uh, The borders of the nation today aren't quite the borders yet that God has promised, but we know that God will always fulfill his word, and those borders will be returned one day. Uh, And God will flesh out what the nation is supposed to look like later on, so I'm not going to dwell on that right now. But for now, Abram is simply given this promise that this land is going to belong to him and his descendants. So what do we read next? He says, to your offspring, I will build, or I will give this land. So Abram built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. As Abraham reaches Canaan, God meets him and gives him this promise, and Abram has the only logical response, and that is to worship. Abram comes to the land, and he worships God by setting up an altar both in Shechem and another between Bethel and Ai. 
So God calls Abraham, or calls Abram, sorry, not Abraham yet, we still got a few chapters to go. God calls Abram to leave his comfort zone, to leave the security of family and home and support, and to follow him fully in faith. And the call of Abraham to leave his home and to go to Canaan was just the beginning of God fulfilling his promise to send a redeemer. Again, this is God beginning this process of making good on his promise in Genesis chapter 3. But Abram was just a man. And I want to make sure that we understand that this morning because if we, if we pontificate him too soon, we're going to read some things that are going to shock us and we're going to say, how on earth could anybody who is supposed to be this, this faithful follower of God commit these acts? How can he do this? But we have to remember that, that Abram was a man. He was just like you and me. Sure, he would certainly go on to become a hero of the faith, and the Apostle Paul calls him the father of those who have faith in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. But he wasn't always that way. And that's what I want us to understand this morning. It took a first step of faith for Abraham to become the man that God desired for him to be. And as we study the life of Abraham or Abram over the next several weeks, my prayer for us is that we will see Abram not as just this hero of the faith that we read in Hebrews, that is, that is who he is, but that we see the man who, as we're going to read in chapter 15, simply believed God, and God accounted it to him as righteousness. Abraham was not a righteous man in and of himself. It wasn't his actions that caused him to be righteous. It was because he showed faith. It was because he followed God in obedience. And my prayer is that we're going to see Abram as an example of growing in faith and obedience to God's word. Because the only thing more important than Abram's faith in this narrative, as we're going to read over the next several chapters and several weeks, is the assurance of God's promise. Regardless of the highs and the lows and the inconsistency of Abram's following, God's promise stays the same. And God's promise never changes. And God's goodness never shifts or wavers. See, God's promise to Abram was, a much, was part of a much bigger promise that he had made to Adam and Eve. God had designed this intricate and wonderful plan to offer forgiveness and redemption to all of humanity through the person of Jesus Christ who would be Abram's descendant. And we're, we're going to connect some of those dots over the next several weeks. But everything... Everything starts with Abram simply placing faith in God and following. Just a man who takes God at his word and obeys. And that same faith that caused Abram to follow God is what should draw us as believers to grow in Christ and to live in obedience to God's word. To see Jesus as the Redeemer who was promised and to live our lives for him as an act of thanksgiving for the salvation that he's given us. Abraham was just a man. We are just ordinary people who have been given an incredible promise. And because of that, my prayer for us is that we would follow in obedience to his word. Let's pray. Father, Genesis chapter 15 tells us that Abraham believed you. He had faith in you, and you accounted it to him as righteousness. God, help us to have this kind of faith that when you call us to, to step out of our comfort zone, to, to, to share the gospel, to live in a radically different way from the society around us, God, give us faith to obey and faith to follow. And as we study the life of Abram, God, help us not to, to, to put him on an unnecessary pedestal, but God, to, to see a man who showed authentic and vibrant faith. And God, most importantly, help us to see your goodness throughout the life of Abram. Help us to see your grace and your mercy, but also your justice and your holiness. God, help us to grow into a deeper appreciation of you and a deeper recognition of the responsibility that we have to dig into your word and to obey this week. God, we love you because you loved us first. 
And we ask that you would help us to show that love to the world around us. I ask that you would bless each one as we go and that we would come back next week uh, recharged and excited to continue reading your word together as family. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. Unless you want to come hang out tonight, we'd love to have you guys here. Uh, You guys have a wonderful week. God bless.